I'm delighted to introduce our first plenary speaker of the uh, Saturday web conference, Jay Sarasagopal, and he has been teaching children and teenagers English since 2007 at public schools, private language institutions and enrichment centres in Singapore. His experience includes preparing learners to take English language examinations, such as the GCE, O and A levels. Jay holds the Cambridge CELTA and the Cambridge Young Learners Extension Awards. During Jay's plenary, we recommend watching in speaker view. And if you have any questions, please type them in the Q&A box. Now, without any further ado, please share your screen, Jay. Thank you, David. Um, I'm Jay, and Singapore. This evening, I'm going to talk about working with young learners and how do we take them from reading to writing. Um, I'm going to. I've designed a plenary as something in which you can participate at the same time, um, and and I will explain the flow as I go. Now, um, working with young learners, especially the lower secondary students, what we must keep in mind is that they have got, they are moving up from a primary level to a secondary level. And the texts that they would like to, sorry, give me a minute. Um, uh, sorry, I've got to, I'm um, sorry about that. Sorry. I'm sorry, I'm going to have to. Thank you. Do you want to reshare, Jay? That's fine. Yes, I'm going to have to reshare this. I'm sorry about that. No problem. Uh, That's great. Okay. okay, and share. Oh dear, I don't know where this is. Um, sorry, I was going to have to go. Want to start slideshow? Um, yes, but it keeps going back to, yes. Thank you. I'm sorry about that, everyone. Um, let me start again. Um, yes, so today I am going to talk about uh, taking lower secondary students um, from reading activities to writing activities. Um, I have designed the plenary such that you can participate in them as well. So let's get me started. Um, yes, I've been working with students in from kids to teenagers since 2007, mainly in Singapore, uh, helping them prepare for exams, as well as um, English as a foreign language or second language. Now, um, through all of that, what happened is, I want to start off with this paragraph or a passage that I've put on the screen. I would like you to type in the chat room immediately what comes to mind when you see a text like this. I, I like the responses. It got overwhelmed. Um, no paragraph, some lengthy article. Long and boring, overwhelming. I'm not reading this. Uh, it's long and difficult text. Yes. Okay. Um, I like that point. A uh, long and long text with no visual support. This one. Too much text on one screen. I refuse to read it. Too long. Okay, like the academic. Mm. 
a look of horror on the students' faces. <laughs> Thank you. Hey, lovely. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask you to read this text, or rather skim and scan through the text really quickly. And remember as many words as you possibly can um, in the next minute or so. Yep. Um, remember as many words as you possibly can in this text. about 30 seconds left. Okay. Now I want you to type as many of the words that you have remembered from the text earlier in the chat room. Remember all Type as many of the words as you can remember from the text earlier in the chat room. Now, what I see a lot of things going on in the chat room. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to continue uh, with the, the slides in the presentation. Now, one of the things I've recognized with students um, who are at the lower secondary level, this is when they start going from a, a more narrative kind of a text type to a more academic kind of a text type or an expository text. Now, this transition can be a bit overwhelming. Um, what I have noticed with the students as well is um, they always need a base from which to start their text, or the, con the context forms um, what they can contribute or understand of the text. And what they then need to do is to kind of analyze all these words and then be able to put it out in writing, um, which then means that usually it works in the classroom. If I'm going to get the students to engage with the text, then I need to very quickly allow them to um, internalize these words and be able to publish them or put it out in writing. Yeah. Um, so that's what I'm going to show you next. Now, students being students, uh, they are being teenagers. They can be like, oh, I am not interested in reading oh, I'm not going to do writing, oh my god, I do not know what I'm going to read, or the text is too lengthy, it's too long, it's too boring, the subject matter. Um, all of this will come up in a classroom. Uh, the other thing to keep in mind as uh, early career teachers is that this is also about the age when they start noticing the differences in the life experiences amongst their classmates or the people around them. Um, this might motivate them, in certain topics, or it might keep them really quiet because they're kind of nervous and they do not know um, how to go about or whether what they're going to contribute is going to be considered enough. Um, like I said earlier, context and formality is something that they will start uh, tackling as they move from their primary levels or from um, their early child years, primary level, into their lower secondary years, early teenage years. Uh, keeping that in mind, now the challenges of working with a text like that with no visual support at all is it can be very daunting and the background setting is often overlooked. Now, the difficulty in engaging with an unfamiliar setting uh, brings it brings with itself a different set of challenge. And there's, of course, the lack of confidence if they feel that they are not fitting in with the students 
uh, with whom they are working. Now, um, what then? What does that? What does that then mean for the teachers? Um, the challenge in engaging the students, checking understanding for reading and writing, and time. Um, if I one tip for early career teachers or teachers who are doing a mid career switch is, uh, if you keep these three in mind and work with a text, how to engage them? What? It, how do you check understanding? and for reading and writing, and the time constraint you have, um, it, you'll, you'll realize that you are better able to deliver them. And I'll show you or share with you uh, some of the things that I do try in my classrooms. Okay? So here goes, it's the same text again. And earlier, I asked you to type in um, as many of the words that you can remember. And you can do it again. Blank empty space. How many words can you recall now? If you, now that you've just looked at the text, okay. um, keep typing in the chat room um, the words that you can recall. Now, the reason why I do this activity with the students at the secondary level is yes. While the text might be a chunk of, a chunk of um, words. It also helps them to kind of identify what words they recognize really quickly. And then when they share it with their friends around them, it kind of activates what they know. And as they share it with their students or their fellow classmates, what happens is you as a teacher start monitoring, okay, what, how much information uh, student A might have, or how much student information student B might have. And it allows you to move the class along as it goes along. Now, what I also then do, uh, I analyze the text before I get into the classroom and I pick out the words that I feel they might want to engage with. Now, simple activities like this. So here goes, again, uh, time for you to type in the chat room. Ready? Unscramble the following one. I see you have a nice chat window. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, most of you are getting it. Correct. Yes, A is. Mm -hmm. Now, as you are typing, yeah, um, what I do is I often go into a text. I will pick out words like um, that, like I said, that I feel is needed for them to engage with, in order for them to write. Um, what I then do is I kind of organize them in a very uh, uh, alphabetical order and give them a, uh, the starting letter for the word. They find it fun, they find it engaging, because if you if you put a time limit to it, they're all often off on the keyboards or they're on the papers trying to figure out which word they remembered and recalled. So it helps them with form. Yeah, it helps them with form. They recognize the word, it helps them with form, they're able to engage with the word, and they are probably writing it out or typing it out. And all of this deals with the form of the word. Okay, so here's the answers. So it's millennia influence community intention at the moment. Um, what I then do is, of course, you're going to go, what is that it? Uh, what I what I tend to do is that I then tend to kind of up the challenge um, for the students by I get the students to then go back to the text and scramble a list of 10 words and play it as a table game. Um, I also do a scrambled back to the board where they have to guess 
what's the word on the board, um, even though it's scrambled. Okay. Or C, uh, students can develop their own, uh, develop and create their own word games on organization approved social media games. Now, I will start off with A and B. Uh, when students get to choose the words and scramble them um, or play scramble like the board, what then happens is if you move around any of these three in a different combination or permutation, um, without them realizing, the students then work with um, the form and with back to the board, they also have to kind of engage with meaning because they will have to explain what the word is about. Um, social media games uh, like Kahoot has really changed a lot of classroom dynamics. I've, I'm more familiar with Kahoot because I know that um, that's what most of the students are familiar with and they often play it amongst family and friends as well. And they find it really engaging because they are given the ownership to then be part of the lesson, be able to contribute to the lesson. And that engagement is really important. It, it, in, in a way, it boosts their confidence and they find it exciting, they find it fun. And interestingly, they also then try and up the challenge for one another. And in all of that leading up to them, slowly forming um, the context for the text and engaging with the words, even though the text you saw earlier was a massive block of words. Um, now, this idea I had built on from visual storyboards. Okay? Visual storyboards um, was something I presented at the YLTC two years ago in 2018. Thank you, David. Um, it was something that was really interesting. Um, I will leave the, the website, yes, the YouTube link later in the chat room. But what I would like to share is, now visual storyboards came. Um, someone typed in the chat room earlier that it was a very heavy text where they don't have any kind of a visual support. Now, the purpose of using a visual storyboard is that it helps the students to predict language. It helps them to sequence events, understand and appreciate content before they engage with the text. Now, in this case, I will show you what's the possible outcome of that very briefly. Let me, sorry, I just can't finish. Now, what I plan to do with the visual storyboard with just the words is those were the five words you saw earlier. Those were the five words you saw earlier. Um, and I put them in my little storyboard here. What I get the lower secondary school students to do is if they see these words or if they have seen these words before or even if they have not seen these words before, What's the kind of image that comes to mind? Get them to take out a, a little whiteboard, a blank piece of paper, a pencil, get them to draw these six boxes, put those words in there and allow them to um, doodle. Yeah, doodle. Would you, sorry, allow them to doodle. And why do I, um, get them to do this, okay? So like I mentioned in the visual storyboard approach, um, they engage with the text before reading. Okay? They engage with the text before reading. Now, this approach is different. I've already given them the text as a block of words. What I'm trying to do now is to extract what they understand or what they have understood or what they know, what they do not know by giving them these guided words where they can then share with us what is in their mind when they see these words. So as they doodle, who does it help? It helps students like um, special education needs students as well. There are students with learning disabilities. Um, there are students who might have an idea of what these words are, but 
couldn't quite really put it in words. No. In order to help them kind of internalize or express how they see these words, I allow them to actually doodle by the side in, during class because to sit in a classroom that long, um, most of us know students can't sit still, so they'll be like, oh, tapping away. So instead of that, I give them this little piece of paper where they can write these words and doodle away as they engage with the activity. Now, um, I will show you then. Now, this is from my visual storyboard um, from my clean at wrong, my sharing two years ago in 2018. Now, as you notice, okay, um, the reason why I'm sharing this is because you will notice that students actually have an idea of these words. Um, they have an image. They are able to put the image to the words. And as the students move up the different levels, what then happens is I'm slowly taking away the image from them and asking them to then put out there what they understand as an image of the word. Um, I will share more of this. Okay. Now, that was the reading bit for it. So how I you, how I'd approach a reading text in a classroom with lower secondary students is I do make it a bit of a challenge for them and I do give them a chunk of um, words like this uh, for different reasons. One, I would have analyzed it. I would have identified the words that I want them to engage with in the classroom. So it kind of brings down the difficulty level for them. Um, I've shown them the text, I've shown them this is what it is. Then I extract the words as a scaffolding for them to engage with the text. Um, and these words should be slightly bit more challenging uh, that they can use in different uh, contexts as well. Once I've done that, because the students have engaged with it um, in possibly informed, definitely, uh, possibly meaning by having to explain what it is and having to doodle about it. They're engaging with the meaning of the words as they understand it. Now, what I do next then is, that's the reading bit. Um, I need them to then kind of slowly take this reading and put it out in writing, which is where the visual storyboard approach comes in. Like I said, I'll share that link later in the chat room. Um, once I'm, once I've worked with the visual storyboard, this is what I do with the students. I would like you to scan this text again, for all the audience, all the participants, and everyone online from around the world. Scan the text again. Okay, scan the text again. Try and remember um, expressions or phrases now. Now, um, as you are doing that. One other thing to note with uh, lower secondary students is also keep in mind that when we are presenting a text, um, keep it, if you remove all the other words, the main words that they will engage with are the nouns and the verbs. Um, the nouns and the verbs, the nouns and the verbs. As I get them to engage with that, that kind of slowly forms a bit of a collocation as well. So. You can do all of these with one uh, chunk of text. So as you are scanning this for nouns and verbs, I'll give you a couple of more minutes, or rather a couple of more seconds to And I shall then move on to the next one. So here I'm transitioning from reading to writing. I have put up these words that I've taken from 
the text earlier. And like I said, um, I usually focus on the noun verb collocation, noun verb collocation, but here I've also thrown in um, the adjectives as well. Okay? So if they had paid attention there, um, or if they've noted something, um, if they kind of recognize certain patterns, they should be able to then match these words. So time for audience engagement in the chat room with these color-coded words. Okay. Can you come up with words that go with another word or rather a pair of words, one that goes with another? Example, um, example, it's instantaneous communication or it's a conventional track that they're going in or it's a virtual community online. So I'll let you have your time. I'll give you about a minute or so. Type in the chat room as many of these words that go together. Which will register phenomenal community. Mm -hmm. Millennia, that's interesting. Phenomenal millennia. I like that. Community. Try now. I would like you to now try and link them three words, like three word phrases. Yep. Three word phrases. If you can. Um, yep. Because I've given you the adjectives, nouns, and verbs. Yeah. Lovely. Instantaneous virtual community connection. What about verbs like register? What about share? What about emerge? Um, what about, let's see, um, down there, compressed. Yes, I did. Mm -hmm. Lovely, the advent of virtual communication. Thank you, Mr. A. Virtual conventional communication. Thank you, Mariam. Share instantaneous communication, lovely. Uh, Nicola, Anna. Um, okay. So as you can see in the chat room, right? While the students might think like, oh, wow, like this text is difficult. But when the, when the role of the teacher in the classroom is to help them engage with the text, then the role of the teacher is also to help them identify words that they might be familiar with, throw in a couple of more challenging words, scaffold it for them. So what I've done now is if you observe, I've gone from the word to collocation to phrases. So what do you think I'm going to ask you to do next? I've gone from a word to a collocation and a phrase. Yes, well done. <laughs> right sentences over uh, yeah. So what I would now like you to do is using these expressions or these phrases that you come up with, or even a word. So you have an option, you have a word. Uh, you have the choice of a word using a word, a, the choice of using a pair of words or a phrase of three words. You are to write five sentences but I think it might be time constrained. So if you can write me three sentences, yeah, three sentences, a word, a pair of words, or a phrase of three words, you can help me write three sentences using them. Off you go. Write three sentences using these words. Lucky. Thank you. If I'm not mistaken, that's an yes. I hope I'm getting um, pronunciation of the names correct. 
Lovely. People track emerging phenomena. Mm -hmm. May I change the form of the word or add articles? Yes, you may. Yes, that's a very good question. You may change the form of the words and you may add articles. Thank you for asking. Oh, yes, it is. Instantaneous communication is overwhelming these days. I never heard. Thank you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's so nice. So the phenomenal community chose to register for the YFT conference. Yay! Yep, nowadays. Um, so, as you can see, this, as the students start putting their sentences together, they have actually engaged with the text and they have also given uh, their spin on what they have read. It might not be that they have read the entire text, but we have helped them engage with the words first, the form, possibly the meaning. We have helped them to put the words together and from there, we have, we have helped them form the phrases. And from there, we have helped them move on to the sentences. Now, these steps at the lower secondary level, um, they are very, very crucial because I think it helps the students feel really confident about themselves. Um, in a writing lesson, yeah, in a writing lesson, I think one of the one of the things that can be avoided is to go in there and tell them, okay, guys, today we are going to write about communications. Take out your pencil and paper and start writing a five paragraph essay. It's not going to work. I think the students are going to be like, oh my God. No. But when we do help them see that they can go from engaging the text or rather skimming, scanning the text, picking out the words, throwing in what they've understood about the words and help them scaffold from word to collocation, to phrases, to sentences, and allow them to see that process for themselves, then you have covered reading and using the same context, you've helped them develop their writing. Now, when we speak of writing, uh, one thing I kind of do is not to say writing means physically writing on the board. It doesn't necessarily need to be that. Um, students formulating these words, phrases and expressions, as well as um, coming up with the sentences per se, okay, and writing these sentences as they go along is writing as well. The only difference is they have conceptualized these writing in their minds, which is really important because it means then when you're not in the classroom, they have walked away with that skill set of engaging with a text and then giving them the confidence to formulate an idea with words that they have become familiar with and being able to putting it out in sentences. Now that skill set is really important because as you gradually built it along from the beginning of the lower secondary years and as it leads up to the upper secondary years, you can see a remarkable difference in what they can come up with. So here goes. One more time. I'm just keeping track of time. Uh, here's the text again. You have one minute to read the text.
Okay, now as you have read the text, okay, going back to when you when I first showed you the text as a chunk of words from which you had to start picking out all the um, words and slowly, gradually building it up into sentences. And now that you've read it, what do you feel about the text or how do you feel about the text? Thank you. So it was intimidating. I can understand it now. Thank you. Now, as you are uh, typing in how you feel, confident enough to read it, thank you. So much easier and more accessible. Now, one of the reasons why I do not actually give them the text as um, a structured piece of article is I found in, in, in my years of experience um, working with students from all over the world, um, even in the public schools, what happens then is regardless, if, especially if they are lower secondary students learning English as a foreign language, even if you give them a text that is broken down um, in paragraph or into paragraph, while it has structure, they might not understand it either. Okay? What I then do is I've tried this um, with students at that level. I usually give it to them as a block because there's a lot of things you can do with it. So apart from picking out the words and playing uh, back to the board, scrambled words, um, scrambled back to the boards, what I then do is I get them to engage with the text and I get the students to slowly read it and allow them to then identify where they might think the paragraph might um, fit in the block of words. So when they're reading the block of words, what I ask them to do is, uh, I, I ask them to then break it down by putting a slash, where do they think is the beginning of a new paragraph? Now, as they compare this, when you finally show them the text, it allows them to then internalize structure. Yep, um, it, it's something that you don't need to always keep going, let me match the paragraph and put it in a flow. Um, you don't even need to cut the paper up. Uh, the students do it for themselves. And in that process, they engage with structure. Yeah. So you in, in that flow, yeah, in that flow, um, in that flow. Oh, that's the last paragraph. <laughs> yes, so in that flow, putting it all together. Um, what I've shared with you is a possible lesson plan that you might want to try with your students in the classroom when you next meet them. Yeah? Because reading and writing is a skill for new learners and new young learners that can be daunting. But as teachers, being the intermediary, helping them realize what they have, helping them analyze the words and slowly building it up, we then help them Come up with the writing now like i said writing can be um in the mind as the structures form in their as they form the sentences in their mind that is equally writing then you can get them to publish their writing and then you can take it from there so you must close the circle yeah the reading and writing circle must be closed and the circle is closed with the words in between and with that I am ready. I thank you all for being here, but I also then have questions and answers. Um, I hope you guys found that useful. Um, let's see, there is my little piece of bar. There is. Thank you. Do you have any questions? Um, I think I'm good for time. I might have ended a bit earlier, but. Um, okay, I have got a question, which is, oh wow, there's another Q&A box here as well. Wow, okay. Uh, okay. I've got a couple of questions.
there's a Q&A box in which you can type your questions and I'm going, I'm looking at the Q&A box as I speak. Um, I'm going to choose as much as I, I can try and I'm going to try and answer as much as I possibly can. Yeah? Um, first, excuse me, are the words of visual storyboards given by the teacher or do students have to complete the chart on their own, with their own words? Um, very good question. Like I said, I'll share the link to the visual storyboard, uh, the YouTube link, if I'm not mistaken, it's here. Um, I will share this privately, I think. Okay. I have a YouTube um, video um, on the YLT SIG in the YouTube channel. Um, if you type my name, YLT SIG, and my name, uh, my entire session on the visual storyboard um, is there and it might better help answer your question. If it helps. Um, what if the demand of understanding the text way to outweighs the demand of five chosen words? Um, that's a very good question. Now, okay. Um, okay, so the question is, what if the demand of understanding the text way to outweighs okay, well, my, my questions keep doing. What if the demand of the text? So this is when choosing the text for the right level comes in. Um, the text must be pitched at the right level. So you might want to challenge the students, but I would strongly advise um, Pick a text that's pitched at the student's level and then uh, the engagement with the words um, become easier, which then follows on to uh, Shirin Pulkavik. Uh, I hope I'm hoping, I hope I'm getting your names correct. Um, are all the words, are all the words related? So, yes, they are. If you noticed in the slide earlier, okay, if you noticed in the slide earlier, what I've done is I, um, I had color-coded them. Okay? I had color-coded them. So when I am picking the words from the text, I have three columns I usually have. It's nouns, verbs, adjectives, and I color-code them. My color-coding is usually blue for noun, red for verbs and green for um, adjectives. But of course, um, you can choose, you can choose what works for your students. I think it's important to keep in mind what works for your students, what kind of a color scheme might work for them. Um, that matters as well, because if you have students who, um, if they have a problem with, a, what do you call it, color deficiency, uh, red, blue, red, green deficiencies, those are important. You have to choose, when you use colors in the classroom, uh, you must be aware that some of them might not be able to see in colors. Okay. Wow. Um, interesting. Okay. Uh, that is a nice question. Uh, the, it is not a silly question. In the storyboard, okay, the students the students get to draw the pictures okay? in the storyboard the students get to draw the pictures now the purpose of the storyboard is because you are trying to see um how does the student visually connect with the word okay? for, for, for a dyslexic student yeah, for a dyslexic student um symbols might be hard to engage with and when symbols are hard to engage with then words become a challenge to them. It's like, what am I looking at? Why am I looking at this? These are strokes and curves and I don't actually understand them. But when you tell them the word and get them to engage with it in drawing, it also allows you to kind of have a visual understanding of how they see their words. Yeah. Um, so yes, ideally, ideally, the visual storyboards are meant for student output to see what they have in them. Yep. And, and, and also it allows the student, the teachers to kind of observe and see how 
or how do the students engage with the words or what kind of images they have in mind. And it also very quickly helps see out, are there any students who might need help in terms of, are there emotional issues here? Are they confident people? Um, because all of that will come up in the image that they do um, put out there in the storyboards. Um, how much time ideally would such process take? Now, most of my lessons tend to be an hour, 45 minute maximum. And then I very conveniently put in the visual storyboards back in the middle so that it kind of breaks the monotony of the lesson because otherwise you're just looking at text and writing in text. And writing. So I kind of put, I allow myself about an hour, 30 minutes maximum, an hour, 30 minutes maximum because um, students need to keep it, for, for them, we need to keep the activity snappy and quick and fast and engaging. And when we, when we throw that in, okay, when we throw that in, um, like how I would have organized my lesson with this lesson flow, you know, or fit the activity based on the ability of my class. Just don't forget, you can have mixed ability classes. You can have um, a, spa, a class where everyone is pretty much just about the same level, but you as the teacher in the classroom then, uh, who is aware of their ability, can then tweak this. I would say, ideally, if you have chosen the correct text and pitched it at the right level, your lesson should produce a reading to writing outcome, at least five, three or five sentences, or even a minimum paragraph within an hour and a half. You know? And then the, the rest of the lesson can be used for either review, um, sharing their publishing, getting feedback, getting students um, to, to um, share it with their classmates to see how they might have tweaked the sentences. So there's a lot of activities that you can follow up on um, from after the hour and a half, depending on how much time you've got. Now, is this technique good for all levels or or just mainly pre int and above. Interestingly, um, I've actually tried these with, I've tried this with um, students learning English as the second language or as the national language, um, as a foreign language. I've tried it with students who have, um, what am I about to say? Yes, um, from primary level to A levels, which is about 18 years old. And I've also tried this with adults. Yes, adults who are learning English as a foreign language, as well as um, their, or adults learning English um, to improve on their accuracy. Yeah? I've tried it across levels, um, students, adults, primary to A levels, pre-intermediate to upper intermediate. Uh, like I say, the teacher being the mediator um, will then have that um, task of, of, of choosing and pitching the text at the correct levels for their students and their class. Um, so yes, to answer that, it, uh, it, it, I've seen results with these techniques across a spectrum of classes. Um, how do I usually uh, assess their writing skills? It's a very good question. How do I assess their writing skills? Uh, my approach to uh, any writing is, why did I ask them to write? What was, what was my purpose of getting them to write? Um, am I checking for content? Am I helping them structure? Am I helping them with sentence structure, paragraphing, word form? Uh, my point being, why are you asking your students to write? And if you have asked them to write, what are you assessing, uh, assessing their writing on? And that must be very 
uh, explicitly stated right from the start. Okay? If you are going to give a writing task, we're going to give a writing task, be very clear right from the beginning. Hey guys, today we're going to focus on form. So you're at, at, at your end task, these are the words we chose at the beginning, and these are what I would like you to accurately produce uh, independently by the end of the lesson. Or um, if you're checking for structure, hello everyone, I am going to start this lesson. I'm going to give you a chunk of words, but the end task today for your writing is that you demonstrate, you understand paragraphing. Then you assess them only on that. Now, assessing a student is really, really, um, and it's a whole different area. Uh, for early career teachers, one thing I can really share and has helped me save a lot of time is when you set assessment tasks, be very clear that that is the one focused area you're looking for. Now, why do I do that? Because one, uh, there's an aim, there's an objective, there's an objective for the learning, yeah? The, the student knows that I only need to focus on this. You cannot go uh, assess the entire writing for um, spelling, grammar, sentence structure, paragraphing, content. It, it doesn't work that way. At a lower secondary level, I, I, I really, really encourage that. Be very specific. Give them a task in a writing task. Tell them what you're assessing them for so that they feel confident and supported in their learning. Okay? And what then happens is over time, you can mix and match different assessment criteria and build on it. Now that helps build the student's confidence and it actually helps the teachers stay very focused in the teacher aim. What did the teacher set out to do in the classroom? Did they demonstrate that at, as well for the students? Yeah? And it also then helps you Ta-da! Save time on marking. Yay! <laughs> so be very, very specific about what you want to assess and make it very clear that's the one focus point that you have for a student. Because you can't expect too much, but when, the, when you allow the students to deliver, you build their confidence. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. Ah, interesting question. Uh, do you think girls approach the task differently from boys? Very interesting question. Um, to be honest, to be honest, um, I've not actually done a study on it. Maybe I should. Uh, what I recall of my experiences in the classroom is, yes, they do approach it slightly differently. Um, Girls tend to, tend to, I'm not generalizing you, I hope it is not, but from my observations though, okay, girls tend to just engage with the task and they also like the idea of um, the, the drawing, the, the, the sketching and all of that. And they tend to want to add a lot of colors and, 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 and brighten up their storyboards or, or, or they, start, they start using different fonts to write. So you'll start drawing leaves and flowers. Um, boys tend to be very direct with the text. They go, okay, that's the word. This is what I want to do. This is what I need to do. And they write it down. And then when you give them a visual storyboard, um, they'll go, um, can, I, can I just draw stickmen? Of course you can draw anything. Draw stickmen on it. Go for it. But then when you get them to work together, I think that's when the magic kind of happens because they each bring with them a different skill set. So I try and try and try and distribute the boys and girls quite evenly out in their groups and always in different groups. They're always in different groups so that they actually become more confident over time um, working with others. Now, um, I don't know how much time I have left but I'm going to keep on. Okay, let me see. I've answered techniques. I've answered assessment. Okay, how do you choose words? I like the ideas, but can you add words out of the text? Very nice question. Um, very nice question. Um, okay, so 
how have I done it in the classroom is when I first um, get them to work with the text, when I first get them to work with the text, I, I tend not to add words from outside the text. Um, only because if my aim is for them to engage with the text, then I think it's fair for me to work with the words from the text so that it doesn't throw off a student. Like, they'll go, oh my God, like, did I not catch this? Text? I don't tend to do that. If you'd like to add words from outside the text, um, I suggest doing it as collocation activities after the writing task. So in a review task, what the teacher can do is they can go back to the text, take, take a couple of phrases, um, get related words you'd like them to engage with, get them to do a matching activity, see if they get that idea, like see if they get that idea. Um, so my advice is try and stick to the text that you've given them because I think it's, it's in a way fairer since we are trying to get them to build confidence as well. Um, if you'd like to add words outside of the text, what I'll do that, or when I will do that is, it's with students in the higher levels, yeah, as they move up from lower secondary to upper secondary, then maybe that approach, you might want to try to, to challenge them in terms of the reading and writing, um, which also then means, um, there's one more question that you might have there. Okay. So there was, how do I choose the words and what if the demands of understanding the text way outweighs it? So the demands I've answered, that's how you, whether you pitch it at the right level. Now, how do I choose the words is often nouns, verbs, adjectives. Now, nouns and verbs, I often keep it. The third one, <clears throat> I play around with it because if, if it's an verb that I want, to, I want them to work on, then I will go choose that verbs. If it's adjectives I want them to work on, then I'll go choose adjectives. Um, if it's articles that I want them to work on, then I'll go choose articles. So it allows you, or it, you, you allow yourself a leeway, but you still have a kind of a base and your students then understand, oh, this is how the activity goes. So it keeps changing for them, but it's different all the time. So I hope that answers this question. <clears throat> done assessing that okay I've done familiar words and new words thank you so much Jay thank you for that thank you thank you thank you everyone for joining me Thank you. Thank you for a great opening plenary and for such a practical session. I think um, with the lower secondary age range in particular, the, the move into reading more challenging texts and in, in an engaging and a motivating way and um, ha having for teachers to have a practical repertoire of techniques and ideas for exploiting reading texts and then leading on and providing scaffolding for um, writing is very important. So I think that was a very rich and a very useful plenary. And it was great that you could take so many questions from our attendees today.